Well, good morning. The faithful who brave the weather. We're glad you're with us this morning as we go through uh, and get prepared for worship this morning. I want to draw your attention to several announcements that are in our bulletin. Don't forget, uh, today, uh, coming up on Tuesday is something worthwhile. Um, so that'll be happening over in the Life Center on, on uh, Tuesday. Then on Wednesday, we begin the preparations for Lent, which includes our Lenten sup- lunches. And that first one will take place over at First Christian Church. And that will be taking place from 11.30 till 12.30 over at First Christian Church on the first one there. Also, some other things going on in the church coming up the rest of this week. Don't forget, we've got our Ash Wednesday service on 6 o'clock coming up uh, on Wednesday evening. It's a short 30-minute service, so we invite everybody to come back for that on, on Wednesday night. Also coming up on Thursday, we see we have UMW taking place. And, of course, the big one, don't forget, Daylight Savings Time begins this next weekend. So that means, what do you got to do on Saturday night? There you go, spring forward. Not spring back, but spring forward. But we're so glad you're with us this morning. If you're worshiping with us online or on Channel 6, we welcome you as well. Because of the weather, we're just thankful that you're with us as well. As we turn our hearts and minds to the purpose we come here today... And that is to worship God. Let us begin our worship this morning. If you'll stand. And help me sing when morning gilds the skies. Let the people tremble. God rules over all creation. Let the earth quake. We praise your great and terrible name. We worship at your footstool, O holy God. God spoke to our ancestors from the clouds and led them by pillars of fire by na- at night. God fills our lives with hope and anticipation and changes them in the likeness of Christ. We exalt your name, O God of all people, for with you there is perfect freedom. 
You may be seated for our prayer of confession. Let us join together as we pray. Our memories are short, eternal God, and we need your nudges to remember your blessings. We get caught up in the worries and wrinkles of living and lose sight of your abiding presence. The urgent and the necessary crowd out playful thanksgiving and heartfelt gratitude. We are polite but distant. We have manners but lack feeling behind the words. Forgive us, faithful God, for outward obedience and inner resistance. Let your light brighten our way. Your peace ease our anxious moments. Your love heal our troubled minds. Your joy kindle our memory and hope. Hear our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. God is faithful and just, and when we confess our sin, God grants us grace. Uh, when we have received his grace, we are set free from all that would hold us back and enabled to enter into life joyfully. So as those uh, who have confessed your faith know, or, uh, know that in Jesus Christ you are forgiven. Let us now, with God's grace in our lives, stand and greet one another with signs of God's love and peace. Peace, brother. You doing all right? Above all.
You ever get tired of your just boring day-to-day -day life? I do. I should say I did. Then I decided to do something about it. Conventional wisdom says you live your life, you grow up, your parents die, they leave an inheritance for you. That wasn't working for me. I wanted to enjoy that inheritance now, so I decided to do something about it. So one day, I walked straight up to my dad, looked him square in the eye, and I said, Dad, I want what's coming to me right now. That's what my youngest son said to me. At that moment, all I could think of was, I'd like to give what's coming to him right now. But he's my son, and I love him. And as much as it put an ache in my heart, I gave him the money, and I told him that he could go search for a life on his own. Not long after that, he packed his bags, and the next thing I knew, I was out of there. The friends, the food, the clothes, it was, it was great. Until my son's money ran out around the same time the country hit a recession. It was bad, really bad. I'd squandered everything my dad had given me, and uh, I, I didn't have anywhere to live, anything to eat. So it was, Hunger pains is a constant reminder of how I'd squandered my life away. I, I lived in agony day after day. After day after day, I would watch and I would wait. And my heart would ache as only a heart can from a parent to a child. But hear me on this. I never once gave up on my child. I knew that he would come back one day. One day it hit me. I realized my dad's lowliest worker was living like a king compared to me. So I had an idea. See, I would go up to him and, and I would humbly just ask him for a job. I, I couldn't expect him to take me back as a son, but maybe he would give me a job, just maybe. It was a beautiful day. I was sitting there on the porch, just enjoying the cool breeze. And that's when I saw him. He stood up, he, he looked, my direction and he squinted his eyes to kind of get a better look at me wondered if he would take me back and then my dad jumped off the porch you know what I did next I ran I've never seen him run so fast he, he, he was like he was like this kid who was excited about something and then and now I realized he was excited about me. My heart was pounding so fast, I just had to get to him. He was running at me with his arms stretched out as if to say, welcome home. Welcome home, welcome home. And as I got closer to him, I could, I could see tears in his eyes. My dad was crying. Tears of joy. And you know what my boy did next? He jumped. <laughs> I couldn't help it. I, I jumped right into my dad's arms and you know what he did? Well, I fell backwards. He, he's a big boy. He helped me. He helped me like only a father could. I just kept saying to him over and over again, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I don't deserve to be called your son. My son. My son is home. Get him some clean clothes. Get him some shoes for his feet. Let's prepare a meal. No. No. Let's prepare a feast. For my son will no longer live as an orphan. Today we will celebrate. For all my hopes have come true. I guess so. I guess it was hope. Hope that kept me going all those days. Hope that... My father would show me mercy. Hope that somehow he would take me back and that I could be forgiven. Forgiven. It is all forgiven. And it is forgotten. And I will never bring it up again. There is no anger. There is no shame. There is no blame. All that's left is just pure joy. For my child was lost, and now he's found.
Our scripture this morning comes from Luke chapter 9, verses 28 to 36. I guess I might have to put on some bass or something. This reflection from the lights. Pretty... This is God's word for us today. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James, and they went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. And while he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them. And they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from, a cloud, from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent. And in those days told no one any of the things that they had seen. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The story of the transfiguration is one of the more mysterious uh, scriptures, one of the more mysterious accounts of a uh, uh, occasion in Jesus' life. Um, what um, seems amazing is to think about Jesus and a couple of the disciples going up on a walk, hiking up the mountain, um, probably for the same kind of reasons that we might go on a hike up the mountain, um, to just get a little distance, to be able to take a little time to, to get away a bit, and, and they go. Um, when you read scripture, one of the things that you'll often uh, see is people going up to the mountain. When they go up to the mountain, it um, should always stand for us as something that uh, means seeking out God's will. Um, there's, there's something about going to a high place to be able to uh, seek God's will. Maybe we think if we get closer, higher, we get closer to God. I don't know. But I do know when I go to the mountaintop and am able to look out at the world, um, it gives me a sense of perspective. And somehow in that, God is able to speak. And so Jesus and the disciples go up on the mountain and hear this mysterious thing uh, of, of the prophets coming and standing beside Jesus. And that revelation to the disciples that uh, Jesus is the Christ. He uh, is God's son. And, and, and it's a confirmation to them but in many ways, I think it probably is a, a reminder, a confirmation to Jesus as well about his identity and about who he is. And all of us as followers um, get that recognition of who Christ is and that we are his. And in the church, we follow him. Now, all that said... Um, then the General Conference of the United Methodist Church has met this week and been in session. And, and I want to talk about what, uh, about what happened and decisions and where the, the life of the United Methodist Church is. And from, from my perspective, and I can only say that from mine, um, I can't speak for the United Methodist Church. I can share what our United Methodist Church positions are. Um, but... I'm, I'm also not going to make this about me and what my view is in this. I, I, there, there are three things I want to do. Uh, first, explain what the United Methodist Church position on homosexuality is, uh, because that was the topic of the conversation. 
to um, describe what took place in the uh, life of the General Conference, and three, maybe give some indications of what I think might happen, not what I think should happen, so understand that, okay? Um, I'm not, I'm, I'm really kind of leaving me out of this. I'm just going to try to describe the particularity of the, the situation. Now, as I do that, I do want to tell you my bias. My bias is that um, when I was a baby, my mom whispered in my ear, you are a Methodist. And so this is the church I love. I love it. I love everything about it. Well, most things, you know. <laughs> there are a few things, but this is, it's my family. Um, it has been my whole life. Many of you may feel that way too. The, another thing I want to tell you that, that reveals a bit of my bias um, is that when United Methodist clergy, um, when, when you become ordained, your membership moves from a local congregation to the annual conference. So I'm not a member of the church I grew up in, Southern Hills, Methodist in Oklahoma City. I'm not a member of Epworth. I'm a member of the Oklahoma Annual Conference with the other clergy members. So that means I have several hundred clergy family members in Oklahoma that are my family. My family in that way. Man, I didn't know it was going to be this emotional. I'm sorry. I really tried <laughs> to rein that in. Um, now, the thing about my brothers and sisters in United Methodist Clergy in Oklahoma is we don't all think the same. Uh, we come from a lot of different perspectives, a lot of different places. And you know what? I love them anyway. What they think is not what's important to me. Um, that they know Christ in their life, that they've been called to ministry, and that they're doing that the best they know how is what's essential to me. Uh, that's my relationship with them. And so we can argue, uh, and believe me, we do. Um, I try to stay out of arguments about that, about really about anything, but, but there are times whenever someone just pushes it so far one way or the other, you know, you kind of have to get in there and, and wrestle with it. So my uh, clergy brothers and sisters have a wide range of views. On the issue of homosexuality, that's absolutely true. Um, that's true in Oklahoma. But that's particularly even more so when you look at the church at a global level. And so whenever general conference meets, uh, that's the body that's gathered. It's not just the Methodist from Chickasha or the Methodist from Oklahoma or even the Methodist from America. It is the worldwide church that, that meets together. And like all families, I don't know, I'm sure that yours probably has those days, there are days when families fight. And um, sometimes it happens in public. You know, usually our family fights probably happen at home, but there's sometimes you may be at the restaurant and it spills out in that place. And um, what we've seen this week is a public fight, a family fight uh, of our church. And, and, and that, that's been hard. It's been hard to watch. Um, some of the things that were said during general conference on the whole spectrum uh, were hard to hear. And um, so anyway, the, the, the conference had, had met. I, want, I just want to reveal that bias. And I'm not going to debate the merits of the decision or dismerits of the decision. I just want to now kind of describe. And, and one other assumption is my assumption, everybody who comes to the table comes in good faith. Um, maybe believing and operating in different ways, but I think I have to assume that. I may be naive in doing so, but I have to assume that everybody who comes to the table, um, when we meet as a church, we as a congregation, the large church as well, comes meeting uh, in good faith. So with that, let me explain 
uh, the, what the United Methodist Church's position has been uh, in relationship to uh, people who are gay, homosexual, I don't, the whole alphabet, whatever it might be. Um, the, the United Methodist Church believes that every person is created in the image of God and is of sacred worth and value. Every person. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter intellectual ability. It doesn't matter economic ability. It doesn't matter um, any way you can divide it. Every person is a child of God created in God's image and deserving to be loved and cared for and welcomed into the life of the church. So any person who comes can come and join, be a part of our congregations, um, can come be a member of our churches, can serve uh, in capacities in the life of the church, can be a part of Sunday school, all those things, take communion, whoever a person might be. Um, that, that's the foundation of where we start. Um, we also believe that, um, that homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. And that's our official position. I should say that's our position. I, some people may believe that, some may not. But that's the position of our, our church. Um, along with that, that someone who is a self-avowed practicing homosexual cannot be ordained for ministry in the life of the church. That's our official church position. So a person can be a member, can participate fully in the life of the church, but can't be ordained in the clergy status as a, a minister. Um, the other official piece of that is that um, our churches can't be used for gay weddings and our pastors can't preside over them. That's the, the position of the, of the church. Um, the truth is, in some parts of the country, that's not been followed, though. Um, and so in other areas, it's followed completely. Uh, to the best of my knowledge in Oklahoma, that's followed completely. Uh, I don't know of exceptions. Where, where I have known of exceptions in the past, people chose to, in its clergy to leave. Um, I, but I can't say that that's 100%, but I don't know of anything. Um, so that's kind of the position of, of what our church, uh, where our church has been. Uh, General Conference. We decided uh, back a few years ago that this issue has divided us so strongly that we needed to have a called session with our bishops giving us leadership to bring us together to, to make a decision about this issue. And so we had a special session of General Conference this past week and to deal with only one topic. Um, that's, that made sense when they made the decision. Uh, the bishops made a recommendation they came with a recommendation of one plan and had two other options that uh, they had also considered. The plan that they proposed was that, uh, they, it was called the One Church Plan. The idea was that um, we would remove those, the language about weddings and about ordination from the Book of Discipline. And in places where, I will we'll tell you, in the Western jurisdiction, which would be um, basically, if you include uh, Arizona coming up through Colorado, going north, all of the, re the western part of the United States, that's not been the practice. Uh, there have been gay clergy, and they do gay marriage services there. And um, that's just been taking place. The, also kind of in the northeastern part of the country. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about jurisdictions in a, a minute. But um, so that, that's not been happening. But the proposal was that we would allow annual conferences to make their own decision through the Board of Ordained Ministry about ordination and local congregations make their decision about whether they would host gay marriages or not. Um, and then we would leave the practice as it is for clergy except without the... Uh, ban of doing gay weddings that no one makes me as a pastor do a wedding. 
I can choose not to do a wedding. I can choose to do a wedding if someone comes and asks. I don't have to do a wedding just because someone asks. But that would, would be left to the discretion of, of the pastors. Uh, that part would, would stay the same. That was the recommendation. So that a place like in Western United States where uh, that, they might choose to ordain someone who was gay, um, that would happen. And in places that were more traditional, um, I could imagine Oklahoma, but I could, don't speak for Oklahoma, that might be a case where that would not be the, the practice by our Board of Ordain Ministry. And local congregations would make their own decision about whether they would host a service or not. That was the recommendation, came with the support of two-thirds of the bishops. Um, they had two other plans, a traditional plan, which was that we keep all of our language the same and add enforcement mechanisms so that thinking particularly in the western part of the United States that there would be an inf a way to enforce um, clergy to not do gay weddings and if there were gay clergy then there would be a mechanism for them to uh, be removed from ministry. That was the traditional plan. And then they had another plan which had a weird configuration where annual conferences would pick one of three, either we're the progressive Methodist, we're the middle of the road Methodist, or we're the conservative Methodist. And, and we would just kind of pick the slot that each church would have uh, with, through a long process, you know, but would, which one we would affiliate with and be connected to one of those. Uh, that one seemed like it was never gonna pass, it never got much support that really the conversation was would the one church plan or the traditional plan be adopted. Uh, the traditional plan was what was adopted. Uh, it was a vote of 53% to 46, 47. It was right on the edge between, if you round it, it rounds up to 47. But 6% difference one way or another. Um, so that was what was, was voted on this week. Um, my, you know, just I, I told you I wouldn't do too much of my own thought, but, but one of the things that I think hurt us in debating it this way is that we only had one thing to talk about, and when General Conference usually meets, we get to celebrate uh, growth in the church in Africa. We get to celebrate things that are happening and, and, and shared ministry together, but here there was just one thing, and everybody had the lines drawn before, and it was going to be a big family fight. And, um, and as much as they tried, uh, because they had a full day of prayer and worship as a part of the design before they started in, um, as much as they tried, it, uh, it was just going to be that kind of thing. And so um, that's the decision that was made. And it was done, I, I, I think it, through the process, a lot of people's hearts are grieving. Um, not because they didn't get their way necessarily, but um, at the division within the church. Some, uh, some are, are sad because the, the position, the, the decision was different than they hoped for. Uh, some of us are just sad because uh, of the division in the church. I, my parents were married their whole adult life. I don't know what it's like to be the child in the middle of a divorce, but it feels a bit like that um, for some of us uh, in, in the way that, that things are, are moving forward. Um, so that's what happened. The question, what's going to happen? Uh, it's open. And I pray for the guidance and leadership of the, the Holy Spirit. But, but here are a couple of things, I, just to be honest with you, and this is the part where I move into some speculation. It, again, this is not what I think should happen. Don't confuse those. Um, but here are some things that I think are going to happen. Uh, the traditional plan, as it was proposed, uh, we have in the church basically the, what we would call a Supreme Court, if you compare it to the Supreme Court. It's called the Judicial Council. And it's made up of lay and clergy members from around the world. Uh, who will rule on the constitutionality of decisions that are made at annual conference. Uh, they were asked to look at all three of these plans beforehand and to raise concerns of anything that they thought might be unconstitutional in the plans so that when 
general conference met, they would know there are issues here that are going to have to be worked out. Maybe some changes would have to be made. Um, so the traditional plan was adopted. There also was one other piece. I, it's important for me to include this. There was a plan also approved for how congregations could leave the United Methodist Church um, if they chose to do so. And the, the, the title put to it was a gracious exit. And not to be punitive, but if a congregation felt they could, in, no, in good conscience, no longer stay in the United Methodist Church, there's a process now for how they can choose to leave. Um, that could be for any number of issues, uh, but that's, that was also passed. So knowing that some might not be able to stay, depending on how the conversation ended, they wanted to make sure that there was an avenue for congregations to be comfortable moving forward. Um, here's, here's my, a couple of my takes. One, they didn't get a chance to fix the things that were raised by the Judicial Council as potentially being unconstitutional. Um, since they've already told us that they think that there are issues there, my hunch is that there will be parts of, of uh, the plan that will be ruled unconstitutional. It'll be about how and where they ask people to do enforcement. Boards of ordained ministries have particular responsibilities. Bishops have certain responsibilities. Those don't all line up by what was approved by what our Constitution Book of Discipline says. So there's going to be some issues there. Some parts of that are going to be ruled unconstitutional. Um, also, I, it seems pretty clear to me that there will be uh, ecclesial acts of disobedience. Um, you have, you know, we talk about uh, civil disobedience of uh, whenever groups of people will disobey what they feel are unjust laws in society. I suspect that there are going to be groups in the church who will uh, be disobedient to what they consider unjust laws in the church. Again, don't confuse what I think might happen with what I think should happen. I just think that that's likely to be the case. Uh, which means that probably rather than solving an issue for us, we've now amplified it. Um, again, my perspective of what I think. I think because we've offered an avenue for leaving, uh, there are probably churches that are going to begin to do that already. Um, either because they feel in good conscience they can't live in a church that has now put these enforcement mechanisms into place, or honestly, there were very there were many at the very most conservative end of the spectrum who were already pushing to leave um, because they just couldn't live with the tension. And now with this available, I think that some of those are going to choose to leave. Um, that's. That's my perspective. Um, the other thing, and, and how many and where, I don't know, but, but I think there will be some who do. The other part of this is the first time we began debating at General Conference the issue of homosexuality was 1972. We've done it every four years since. 1984, we put in to place the uh, the ban of gay clergy in uh, 96. We put in the ban of gay marriages. Um, we've debated this every four years. Uh, so guess what? 2020, there's going to be another general conference. Um, this will be debated again. It's not over. It's not settled. Um, it, it's going to be a part of the conversation. Um, I. It feels like we're really at a place of tension. Um, I've always, I've always been, <laughs> maybe naively, uh, thought we would work this out somehow. I don't know, I thought we would figure out a way to, to work it out. Um, maybe just my love for the church, maybe my love for my brothers and sisters across the whole spectrum in our denomination uh, has, has caused me to be somewhat naive in thinking we might work it out. But, um, it's clear that we have, we have five jurisdictions in the United States. 
We have the Western jurisdiction and the Northeastern jurisdiction who both are pretty outside of, of the practice that uh, we have as a United Methodist Church um, have established. Those parts of the church are, are clearly the, uh, the places where those laws, those rules are uh, being pushed aside. There's the southeastern jurisdiction and the south central jurisdiction. We're, as Oklahoma, within the south central jurisdiction. Those have been kind of the bedrock of our most traditional part of the church. But, you know, it, 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 they're not absolutes in, in lines. Uh, and then there's the south central or the north central jurisdiction, you know, which would include from Minnesota and all those states up there, the cold states maybe, I don't know. Um, and, and, and that's pretty split. It's pretty divided. Um, I, it, it's that part of the church that, that moves both ways in terms of those, uh, those poles. And, and this is going to be a place of tension for a while. Um, I wish I could tell you it was solved. I really do. I wish I could tell you that uh, we, we had an answer that was going to move us ahead. Um, I, think, I think, honestly, uh, that would, would be too naive, even for me. Um, I think we're just going to be in a place of tension for a while. Um, and it's possible we might be looking at division uh, in the future. There certainly are those who have readied a plan to create a new denomination within the, the, the church. Um, there's... The structure has already been approved for a whole mass of churches to leave and become a, a new denomination. Um, the, it was all kind of waiting to see what would happen at General Conference. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. What I know is it's not the first time we've been divided within the church. I mean the big church. Uh, part of reason we as Methodists are here is because of the Protestant Reformation, uh, which there was division in the life of the church. Uh, it brought forth, in, in my view, greater fa fidelity and faithfulness to Scripture uh, as the Reformation took place, um, but, but it's not the first time. Uh, the Methodist Church split off from the Church of England, um, the, the Anglican tradition, um, and there was division. Uh, even within our Methodist family, not only have number of denominations broken off from time to time, but we were divided between the Southern Church and a Northern Church during the Civil War. For 70 plus years, we were two separate denominations uh, because of division. Um, the thing that I do want to do is not leave you in despair. Um, the church is the Lord's. The Lord is the Lord of the church and of the world, and what God does is bigger than an indi individual congregation or denomination. What God does, the Christ we serve, is uh, a God of, of love that is transformative in the work of the world. And um, whatever lies ahead in the future for our denomination, uh, Jesus is Lord. He was Lord yesterday, he is Lord today, he will be Lord tomorrow. And, um, and that part is where we know we can put our faith and our trust in him and serve him to the greatest degree of our capacity. Um, as your pastor, that's what I try to do. Um, I have very little influence in any of those decisions, none at all. So what I try to do is to faithfully serve here where God has called me to serve as your pastor, and I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that as faithfully as I can. I hope we as a congregation can serve God faithfully in the life of this church as long as we can, following his guidance and direction, um, and to do that with, with good hearts and good intent and uh, with good love toward each other I, I, and, and, a, and a bit of grace with each other. Um, because there's some folks who are bruised up right now, and, um, and they need love and care. They need that from us, and so we can be that for each other. Um, 
we live at a time where it is, we are more likely to draw lines and divide ourselves up than any other point in history, I think. But I think God calls us not to, to live in that, that place. And it doesn't mean we sacrifice our conviction or our views, um, but that we treat each other with love and grace. And I think that's going to be important um, uh, now and in days to come. We'll see how many things I guessed right. Um, we'll see what, what takes place. It'll unfold. Uh, God's history unfolds. But um, I felt like I had to spend a little time this morning just kind of walking us through what, what's gone on and where we're at so that we all understand clearly uh, what the views of the positions of the United Methodist Church are, what the decisions have been made, and what um, some likely possibilities of future might hold for us. Um, I share that with you. If, if you have an interest, uh, delegates to general conference will be the next general conference will be elected from Oklahoma at annual conference this coming year. Um, there is a process if you go to the uh, Oklahoma conference, the United Methodist Church website for nominating uh, a person, a lay person to, to, to go. I'll tell you there's like eight laity and eight clergy who go. Uh, getting elected is a grueling process. Um, usually it takes multiple years of putting yourself into the process to get elected. I, I just, you know, since I'm sharing with you that there's an opportunity, I also want to share with you the difficulty of it as well. But if, but if a person felt convicted to, to want to be a part of that decision, that's the, the way it would, would happen. And so from all of Oklahoma, there'll be 16 people elected to go forward to the next general conference to hold our views forward and uh, be a part of that decision. So God's grace, God's peace, God's love, and may it be transformative uh, in all of our lives. Amen. If you would stand, please, and help me sing, Be Thou My Vision. Thou my return a little bit of what we've been blessed with. So as the ushers make their way forward this morning, let's pray. Father, as we come to you today, please bless these offerings that we give today, that they may be multiplied and used in your glory. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.
may be seated. And let us join together in the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by the water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to you, he broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to you, and he gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. He is not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If those who are assisting will come forward at this time. invites us to come and share. You're invited to come.
Jesus given for you. Body of Christ 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 given for you. The body of Christ given for you. given for you. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you.
Please join me for the sending forth. God reigns not only in this place, but wherever we go this week. There is nowhere we cannot go beyond the reach of God's care. Renounce disgraceful and underhanded ways, for God is not served by cunning and deceit. We seek to live truth. The holiness of God shines upon you and empowers your witness and service. We will meet God in prayer and walk with God in places of human need. Amen.